Please stay tuned for important disclosure information at the conclusion of this episode. Welcome to the Investing Insights Podcast from Morningstar. In this week's podcast, Damian Conover examines how the healthcare sector has handled pandemic pressures, Kevin Brown names two REITs with high dividend payouts, Ben Johnson gives investors tips on index concentration, Brian Colello shares what we can expect from the technology sector, and Dave Meats addresses the massive impacts coronavirus has had on the energy sector. Let's get started. Damian Conover from Morningstar Research Services examines the healthcare sector's third quarter performance. In looking at the healthcare sector, we've seen some strong performance over the last 12 months. The sector as a whole is up almost 25% over the last 12 months. And that's largely in line with the overall market performance. Now, I think there's a few things that are important to point out about the healthcare performance. The underlying fundamentals are largely solid. And with the U.S. elections coming up, healthcare is going to be a very important area of focus with the political rhetoric. Although we don't expect any major changes to the healthcare sector because of policy changes, a lot of this has to do with both of the leading presidential candidates looking at healthcare in more moderate levels of reform. From a valuation perspective, when we take a step back and look at where healthcare is now, overall, we see the sector is slightly overvalued. Now, part of that's due to the recent run-up that it's had, and we only see a few good buys within the space. Within the industries of healthcare sector, the two areas we're advocating people to take a look at are the drug industry and the managed care organization space. These are two industries that, in our view, look undervalued. Now, some of this has to do with the potential changes in healthcare policy. Now, again, we don't expect major radical changes, but the market is implying a lot of potential pressure for both of these groups. On the drug side, there's a lot of heated rhetoric around bringing down drug prices. But from our view, we expect more moderate changes with whoever gets into the presidential office and whichever group, Democrat or Republican, takes over the Congress. Similarly, from the managed care perspective, we don't expect Medicare for all to be rolled out. We expect more modest changes, even if Democrats roll in to both the Congress and the presidential office. From a fundamental standpoint, we think the healthcare sector is adapting well to the coronavirus and the related economic pressures. One of the things that is important to note with the coronavirus is it's really having a more modest impact on the drug stocks and the managed care industry. Drugs are being prioritized, and interestingly, a lot of the more expensive surgeries are being put off, and that's actually beneficial for managed care organizations so they don't have to spend as much to reimburse those expensive surgeries. Outside of those industries, a lot of the other groups within healthcare are facing some pressure. So we think about the dental group and we think about some of the life sciences groups. A lot of those purchases and utilization rates have dropped down during sort of the peak of the coronavirus back in the April, May time period, but subsequently are rebounding very significantly. Additionally, from the economic impact of the coronavirus, because healthcare tends to be prioritized, this is an area where we think will bode well, despite some of the increased economic pressures that are likely still to come. In looking at the coronavirus over the next 12 months, we really see the potential cure coming from the healthcare landscape. The vaccines in development right now from some of the leading firms, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Moderna, these are all vaccines that potentially could have pivotal data by the end of the year. Now, we think this is important from a societal standpoint, but we don't think this will be a major driver of cash flows because a lot of these vaccines will be priced at a non-for-profit basis. Nevertheless, the goodwill that these companies could engender should potentially help them in defending against the pricing power of other drugs against potential new policy measures. Overall, when we look at the healthcare space from a stock perspective, a couple names that we think are most undervalued that we'd highlight within the managed care organization, we really like Anthem and CVS. Again, well-positioned entities that shouldn't face a lot of pressure from new policies. On the drug side, Pfizer and Biomarin are two names we really think are well-positioned with underappreciated pipelines in areas of unmet medical need, which regardless of new potential political policies should still have strong pricing power that we think is underappreciated by the market. Six days a week, we deliver the latest news for investors. Just say, Alexa, enable the Morningstar skill 
or visit Morningstar.com Alexa. Now, Kevin Brown from Morningstar Research Services names two REITs with high dividend payouts. Real estate investment trusts are often utilized by income-oriented investors for their high and relatively steady dividend payouts. So we want to highlight two companies that are both paying above average dividends and trading at discounts to our fair value estimates for the companies. The ongoing pandemic has negatively impacted the ability of many REITs to collect revenue from their tenants, so a significant number reduced or suspended their dividend payments for the second and third quarters. The two companies we are highlighting today have maintained their high dividend payouts in both the second and third quarters, and we believe their cash flows should remain steady enough to consistently pay their current dividend levels. Shopping Center REIT Regency Center's underperformance in 2020 means that the company is currently paying a dividend yield near 6% while also trading at a discount to our fair value estimate. The company traded off on fears of retail weakness stemming from the coronavirus shutdowns and a broad economic recession impacting the company's portfolio. However, Regency's strategy to own high-quality shopping centers with grocery stores as anchors is paying off as grocery stores have consistently produced double-digit sales growth since the start of the pandemic. This is keeping foot traffic high at Regency's portfolio, which supports sales growth across the portfolio and thus revenue for Regency. We therefore think Regency's dividend is relatively safe despite the chaos in the retail environment. HealthPeak is a healthcare-oriented REIT, currently paying a low 5% dividend yield and is currently trading at a modest discount to its fair value estimate. The company's portfolio of life science buildings in some of the largest research campuses across the country and medical office buildings attached to major hospital systems should continue to provide HealthPeak with dependable, growing streams of revenue. While senior housing is going through a downturn due to the coronavirus, this segment should produce growth over the next decade as demand from baby boomers picks up. We think HealthPeak presents a safe, short-term investment with fundamentals that will trend upward over the coming years. In summary, there are several REITs with high dividend payouts trading at attractive discounts that income-oriented investors should consider adding to their portfolio. Watch all the Morningstar content you love from your living room. Download the Morningstar Roku channel and get up-to-date independent insights on today's markets. Be comfortable. Be informed. Next, Christine Benz from Morningstar Inc. and Ben Johnson from Morningstar Research Services discuss index concentration. Hi, I'm Christine Benz from Morningstar. Are major indexes getting more concentrated in their top holdings? Joining me to discuss that topic is Ben Johnson. He's Morningstar's Global Director of ETF Research. Ben, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Christine. So Ben, let's talk about this topic. There's certainly been a lot of chatter about it. Um, When you look across major indexes, are they in fact getting more concentrated in some of their top holdings? This has absolutely been the case, especially over recent months. And if you look at the S&P 500, for example, and its top five constituents, specifically Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, and Google, those five companies alone account for 22% of the index's value right now, which obviously is reflected in all of the various index funds and ETFs that are underpinned by the S&P 500. Now, to put that in context, historically, 22% is incrementally higher than that was at the very peak of the technology bubble, where it reached about 16 and, or 17%. It is higher than it's been going all the way back to the early 1970s. So you know, many investors are, are seeing this in, in growing concern. So how problematic is it? Is it a a feature or a bug, as you put it? Well, when you think about market capitalization weighting, it is definitionally a a feature. It's what investors have signed up for. They've taken their hands off the wheel and said, I am going to relinquish the allocations within this index portfolio to the wisdom of the crowds. But sometimes the crowds go a little bit mad and Honestly, we'll only know in hindsight whether this most recent spike in the concentration of the index is is more attributable to wisdom or perhaps more so to madness. What index investors know for certain is that by sort of free riding off of the collective wisdom or lack thereof of the markets, they're 
dialing down the costs of that portfolio. Uh, they're leveraging what over a long period of time has generally been more wise than mad. And ultimately, that has yielded over longer periods of time a very good result for a very large number of investors. But it's important to understand that there have been episodes which have often, like in the case of the tech bubble, been preceded by this degree of concentration, where for a number of years subsequently, indexing hasn't felt like that hot of an idea. So let's discuss those risks, because I think that's what investors who might own an S&P 500 index fund might be concerned about, that they are getting overexposed to a potentially overvalued pocket of the market. So how should investors think about that? I think first and foremost, it's important to acknowledge this fact, to acknowledge the fact that you're you're relinquishing the, the management effectively of the portfolio to the market at large, and that there are pros and cons to taking that approach. So I think the more investors can manage their own expectations, know that at least based on history, periods, again, similar to what we're seeing today, have been followed by you know, an unwinding um, of concentration, which you know, generally has had negative effects on the market at large, because it's not just index funds, but really all funds and all investors that have a significant amount of capital invested in these very same names. Uh, and what investors can do, I, I think, at the margin is maybe reconsider some of their allocations, maybe rebalance at the margin if they've got different uh, funds that make up the equity sleeve of their portfolio. And they might also want to consider certain approaches you know, within the index space that anchor more firmly on, on fundamentals or, or a bit more valuation sensitive. So one example uh, fund that we've long thought highly of is the Schwab US Dividend Equity ETF. The ticker for that ETF is SCHD. So this is an equity income oriented ETF that looks at dividend yields and looks at dividend track records and strikes a nice balance between valuation discipline and quality. It looks for stocks that have a long history of paying and growing their dividends. So approaches like this can help strike an appropriate balance. They simultaneously continue to leverage the wisdom of crowds and the extent that this fund weights its 100 or so uh, constituent stocks by market capitalization. And it boasts a low fee at, at six basis points. So all of these factors uh, underpin our Morningstar analyst rating of silver for this ETF, which indicates our conviction that this is a fund that will in all likelihood outperform its category index over a long period of time. So is a fund like this something that I would use to augment my S&P 500 or total market exposure, or would I use it instead of? It, it's really quite dynamic, Christine. So in many investors, it could be a perfectly suitable core holding. Other investors that might be interested in, in juicing their income stream a, a little bit, getting exposure to high quality dividend paying firms might be attracted to the fact that this fund, uh, as of now, has a, a 4% SEC yield, which is competitive considering many of the alternatives. Now, this is still a stock portfolio, right? It's it's not cash money. Um, you know, it's, it's not a savings account. There's no FDIC insurance. You're still buying stocks and you're going to get all of the volatility that comes with that. But nonetheless, an, an attractive yield uh, for a basket of stocks that should over uh, a variety of different market conditions and tough ones in particular hold up better than the market at large. Okay. And it also seems like assessing my baseline asset class exposures would also be something to take a look at at this juncture, maybe looking at my U.S. relative to non-U.S. or even my fixed income relative to equity exposure, that if these market segments are getting more concentrated, that arguably um, they're also maybe a little bit overvalued at this point. That's absolutely the case. So your average investor at this point in time might be slightly overweight uh, U.S. equity exposure relative to their target allocations. Within their U.S. equity exposure, they might be slightly overweight uh, growth relative to value, and it may be time to, to revisit and rebalance those allocations. Okay, Ben, really helpful discussion. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. I'm Christine Benz for Morningstar. Now Brian Colello from Morningstar Research Services shares his expectations for the technology sector. 
Technology has been a significant outperformer to the broader market in 2020. Over the past 12 months, as of September 2nd, tech was up 65% year-to-date versus 25% for the broader market. Over the past three months, again ending on September 2nd, tech was up 21% versus 16% for the broader market. And again, as of September 2nd, the median technology stock was about 15% overvalued in our view. So this is one of the frothiest valuations we've seen in tech since about 2007. The software has continued to do really well in 2020 as it's been minimally affected by COVID. Some tech firms have even been counter-cyclical to the market, and they've been winners in the work-from-home trend. The median software stock, in our view, is 19% overvalued uh, versus 11% undervalued at this time a quarter ago. Uh, We think growth will be somewhat slower in 2020, inevitably, but we think business conditions will bounce back in 2021. Employees still need to access software while working from home. The remote working will likely continue to be adopted, which is good news for names like Zoom, Microsoft, Slack, DocuSign, and some others. But we think valuations are full today. Cybersecurity is also seeing a boost in spending, especially for cloud vendors like Zscaler, Okta, and CrowdStrike. Across technology, hardware names are fairly valued, but generally we don't see a lot of wide moats in that sub-segment of tech. The higher quality software, semis, and cybersecurity names are a bit expensive, but names we still like are Palo Alto Networks and VMware. Looking ahead to October earnings, we'll be keeping an eye on business conditions in software and cybersecurity, any signs of deal delays or cancellations. Uh, We'll also be looking at demand for semiconductors. Over the past six months, data centers and PC spending was strong. Uh, We'll see if that's softened or if they're still spending there as uh, companies refresh their IT equipment. Now, automotive chip demand cratered due to manufacturing shutdowns at the start of COVID. So we're expecting a near-term bounce back there, but we'll see how how well that recovers. Uh, And then finally, we've seen a lot about U.S.-China trade tensions and geopolitical risk in the past few months. The U.S. government's ban on Huawei, which started last year and has been ramping up, uh, has continued to weigh on U.S. technology demand for over a year now. Uh, There's certainly a complexity about how TikTok will ultimately be handled, WeChat in, in China, and perhaps other technologies, both in the China and then even retaliatory in the U.S. And lastly, Dave Meets from Morningstar Research Services addresses the massive impacts coronavirus has had on the energy sector. The Morningstar U.S. Energy Index has lagged the broader domestic market. Energy stocks underperformed in the third quarter as crude oil prices have been stubbornly flat and well below the mid-cycle level of $55 a barrel for WTI crude that would incentivize the right level of development activity from swing producers like U.S. Shale and OPEC. However, we believe the market is still extrapolating bottom of the cycle crude prices to infinity, making energy stocks look historically cheap. Energy is still the most undervalued industry sector, trading in a discount of about 30% to our intrinsic fair value estimates. The massive impact of COVID-19 on global demand is the primary reason that crude prices and energy stocks have not recovered along with the broader markets. We estimate a year-over-year decline in consumption of around 8 million barrels a day, easily surpassing prior downturns. To mitigate the impact of record stockpiles on crude prices, producers, including the OPEC Plus Group and U.S. shale firms, have made dramatic production cuts and very little development activity is taking place. As a result, we think worldwide production will also decline by about 5.7 million barrels a day this year. This narrows what would otherwise be an unmanageable surplus, though inventories are still expected to spike well above normal levels by year-end. And the environment for crude producers does not look much better in the fourth quarter, as the pandemic has not yet subsided enough to allow for a meaningful surge in travel that would drive up demand for gasoline and jet fuel. But we continue to expect catch-up growth in 2021 and 2022, bringing long-term demand almost back in line with pre-COVID projections. But after making major cuts this year, producers aren't geared up to meet that demand. In the U.S., the horizontal rig count has slumped to about 200, well below the 600 rig Goldilocks level needed. Without a rebound in oil prices in 2021, producers will have no incentive to grow their production or even replace declines, resulting in a downward spiral for supply that could eventually turn the current crude glut into a shortage. That does it for this week's Investing Insights podcast from Morningstar. We hope you have enjoyed our program and we welcome your feedback. Please send your comments and questions to podcast at Morningstar.com. From everyone here at Morningstar, thanks for listening. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Opinions expressed are as of the date of recording. Such opinions are subject to change. 
The views and opinions of guests on this program are not necessarily those of Morningstar Inc. and its affiliates. Morningstar and its affiliates are not affiliated with this guest or his or her business affiliates unless otherwise stated. Morningstar does not guarantee the accuracy or the completeness of the data presented herein. The podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered tax advice. Please consult a tax and or financial professional for advice specific to your individual circumstances. Morningstar Research Services LLC is a subsidiary of Morningstar Inc. and is registered with and governed by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Morningstar Research Services shall not be responsible for any trading decisions, damages, or other losses resulting from or related to the information, data analysis, or opinions or their use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. All investments are subject to investment risk, including possible loss of principal. Individuals should seriously consider if an investment is suitable for them by referencing their own financial position, investment objectives, and risk profile before making any investment decision.